Today's August 23rd, 2013. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner, and with me is Tony Hilliard. We are both volunteers here at the History Center. We're all honored to have with us today Mr. Robert Milo O'Brien and his wife, Julia O'Brien. Uh, Mr. O'Brien is a veteran of both the Korean War and the Vietnam War, and he's kindly agreed to tell us his story so that it can be made part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Mr. O'Brien, we really appreciate you coming in here today, and we're looking forward to hearing your story, and we're honored to be with you. Um, just for the record, would you give us your full name and current address? I'm Robert Milo O'Brien. I am a junior, okay. and there is a Robert Milo O'Brien III, which is my son. Oh, okay. My uh, uh, father is deceased, so I don't usually use the junior anymore. Okay. Uh, I've been called Robin since I was two days old. Uh, our families were full of Roberts, Bobs, Bobbies, and so <laughs> yeah. on, so they started right out calling me Robin, Good. and I go by Robin. Okay. Where and when were you born? I was born August the 18th in 1938 in uh, Cushman, Arkansas. Actually, I was born in Batesville, which is outside of Cushman, but if you blink, you just miss Cushman. It's, <laughs> it's not one of the biggies. Okay. Uh, my mother went there uh, for my birth. Uh, she was there for my older sister who is deceased now, and I believe the same doctor delivered my mother and my sister and me. Uh, when I was two weeks old, uh, she went back to Detroit, Michigan, and I've never been back. Uh, I don't miss Arkansas. <laughs> but uh, we lived there for a while, then uh, my father uh, worked on the Fisher Building during the Depression. He was a steeplejack, which was a very dangerous profession. But uh, my mother was concerned about that, so he applied for other employment and uh, secured a job with the Santa Fe Railroad. And we moved to the Mojave Desert, about halfway between Barstow and Needles, California. Uh, my father ran the pump station there that pumped the water for the steam engines, and we were there during uh, World War II. The uh, Army had uh, an armor uh, unit that uh, was doing their maneuvers and training right across the dirt road from us. We were two miles off the highway down next to the railroad and uh, I used to go and get up on top of the uh, pump house and watch the tanks do their maneuvering out in the desert there huh. and as a little boy that was quite exciting. Yeah. Uh, the troops they uh, were training there they wanted them to think they were going into uh, North Africa and issued them Bermuda shorts and so on and they used those, they, they were still wearing them when they went ashore in Normandy. <laughs> they, huh. The uh, troops that were trained there went to Normandy. Huh. My father moved a lot on the railroad. I went to more than 12 schools before I started high school. And uh, then he quit the railroad. We lived in the San Joaquin Valley and I went to the same school for four years. Uh, Turlock High School, which is between Modesto and Merced. And I graduated from high school there. We lived on a dairy farm. I used to get up at uh, three something in the morning and go milk all the cows and then shower and shave and walk a mile to catch a school bus that came at 7.30. Uh, because of the dairy and the work there, I uh, was not able to participate in any uh, intercollegiate sports. I, I just, yeah. it wasn't time. Yeah. I did not get along well with my father and uh, I graduated from high school one night and uh, left home the next day and went out in the world to seek my fortune. Huh. I worked for a period of time as a uh, a uh, uh, tree trimmer for a, a company in Pasadena and we trimmed the trees beneath the uh, power lines and yeah. that was exciting and then I realized that all of those guys that were working with me were in their mid 40s early 50s and they were going nowhere. Yeah. I said there needs to be a better way and so I enrolled in college. Went to uh, Idaho to go to Rick's College, and uh, during the summertime I uh, secured a job up in Yellowstone Park. I had five mules and three horses and packed supplies for the government and uh, patrolled the boundaries of the park. 
I was going to try and be a smoke jumper, but it was not a good year. You get paid a base wage and then extra if you jump the fires, and there weren't very many fires that year, and so I, I stayed with the uh, mules and was packing supplies. It was a good job. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. You got to be really good friends with your horse because you spend the whole <laughs> summer 40 miles from the nearest road out in, <laughs> in the backwoods. And uh, once every two weeks they would bring our uh, mail and uh, whatever food I had ordered across the lake in a boat. And uh, that was my contact with civilization was every two weeks. <laughs> uh, during the winter the uh, wasn't anything there, so I went back to college in the winter. Did pretty good at that and enjoyed it, and uh, since there was no place to spend any money, I always had enough money to start college the next year, which, uh, which really helped. I enjoyed uh, uh, the social life of college. I enjoyed uh, life in general. I did not like studies. I did not do well. I never got a really good start in school. Uh, when I started school, the uh, school teacher didn't have a degree, but she'd had two years of college, so she was the most qualified. <laughs> and uh, the students there, there were, uh, I think, 38 or 40 students in one room with the one teacher, and uh, grades one through eight. And when you got to the eighth grade, you stayed two years in the eighth grade and quit school. Or if your parents were well-to-do, you went away to high school like people go away to college now. But the eighth graders would teach the first, second, and third grade, and so I didn't get a real good start in school to begin with. <laughs> Grades were not good. I was in uh, Yellowstone, and uh, the last year I was there out in the backwoods, I cut my thumb off with an axe. And uh, I looked down, my axe slipped and the thumb fell off and I looked down and said, oh my goodness, I have cut off my thumb or something to that effect. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> gathered it up, stuck it back up there and wrapped my handkerchief around it and then held my arm to keep from bleeding to death. Went down to the lake, there happened to be a boat there. They took me across the lake in the boat, 30 something miles and then 90 miles in the back of a pickup truck to get to a doctor. And the doctor didn't want to sew the thumb back on, but I said, look, I've saved that thumb all this way, and I really need that, so you don't have anything else going on, please put it back on, and if it doesn't work, you can take it off again tomorrow. Well, it worked, and uh, I still have the thumb. I did not go back to uh, Yellowstone. Uh, the next summer, I uh, secured a job working on the railroad in uh, Mount uh, Shasta. I worked on the McLeod River Railroad driving spikes and doing pick and shovel work putting in ties which was brutal uh -huh. summertime work. Uh -huh. But fortunately uh, they had a lot of forest fires that year and the uh, forest department uh, drafted our crew to go fight forest fires. And I uh, was grubbing the, the forest line there and I asked the ranger, I said, how much money am I making? Well, he said, you're making a dollar and a half an hour. I said, and how about this guy over there? He's sitting under a tree filing his chainsaw. Well, he's making five dollars an hour. So I laid my hoe down, I hitchhiked into town, I bought a used chainsaw and hitchhiked back out. I said, sign me on, I'm a tree faller. <laughs> so uh, I spent that summer uh, making lots of money uh, as a timber faller came time for college and I said, you know, for the money I'm making, college can wait one more semester. And uh, I was notified that I would be drafted uh, the next month. I said, oh, this is not good. <laughs> so I went down and enlisted. And what year was this? This was in 1959. Okay. Right after they had stopped shooting in the Korean War, oh. I think they stopped in 54, 55. Okay. But, uh, I enlisted so that I could get my choice of training. I said, look, I'm a lover, not a fighter, and I wanted to be a medic. So they sent me to uh, medical school at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And uh, I entered the uh, military in, uh, on Friday the 13th, November in 1959. After basic training at uh, Fort Hood, I went to Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And uh, I did really well there. Uh, the second month I was there, I was the soldier of the month for the entire fort and uh, was selected for advanced medical training. 
which I did and then uh, was assigned for my first duty assignment as the uh, ambulance driver in the emergency room at Fort Knox, Kentucky in Ireland Army Hospital. It only lasted about 90 days and then they sent me to Korea. I was upset about that because they sent me three days before I could have made private first class. <laughs> well, that's 12 bucks a month you know, for me. when you're making nothing. That's, that's a big deal. And I said, look, I, I want to be a PFC, but no. He said no, and they, they sent me to Korea. And then I looked at my orders and they were sending me as a truck driver because I'd been driving the ambulance. I said, I'm not a truck driver. I'm a medic. I'm a corpsman. I'm highly trained. Well, this worked on me. I got to Kashini Barracks in uh, Japan, and I was upset. So I got out the phone book and found the biggest name I could find was a general somebody, and I called the general. <laughs> I said, "There's a said, you know, this is a, a real injustice is being done here, sir, and he sighed and listened to my sad story. I gave him my name and number and told him that I was a medic, not a truck driver. And uh, he said, well, I'll see what I can do, and I'll call you back tomorrow. Well, at 3 o'clock in the morning, they gathered us up and shipped us to Korea, and I thought, well, I'm doomed now. <laughs> but I got to Korea, and uh, the uh, fellows that went over with me all got their duty assignments and left, and I was still at the induction center there. And another group came in, and the next day they all moved out, and I'm still there. And, the next day, the uh, group came in, and they're there one day, and they all moved out. I'm still there, and I thought, wow, what's going on? And then they notified me that I would be assigned to the uh, uh, MASH hospital unit right there where I was at Pleiku. Not Pleiku, it was Ascom City, about halfway between Incheon and Seoul. And so I became a corpsman uh, there. Got a really cushy job working on the dermatology clinic, and uh, I was the only corpsman on duty there, and the doctor liked me, and uh, I got along well with the patients. I talked to the uh, staff sergeant that was in charge there, and I said, uh, I noticed Major Craig is a female. Uh, I'd seen her every day. She's all over the hospital. She's in charge. And in the evenings, I'd see her with the uh, Navy captain. He looked like a big glass of milk with some I was there stuff on his chest, you know. <laughs> and they're arm in arm going in and out of the BOQs and all of this. I said, Major Craig, pretty attractive. He said, yep, she's a pretty woman. And uh, he said, her husband's a captain. Oh, I said, that's cool. And he's in Inchon Harbor and they get to stay together, you know. Yeah. Next day she came on the ward and she's all bubbly and he said, my goodness, ma'am, you're happy today. What's going on? Oh, she said, my husband telephoned me last night. I said, well, what's so big about that? We see you with him every day. <laughs> she got very red. Everybody got busy behind a newspaper. The sergeant disappeared, and I thought, what's going on? Then she left. The sergeant says, nice going, O'Brien. <laughs> Her husband is a captain in the Marines at Camp Pendleton. <laughs> Oh, a little naive me, I know, I never suspect things like that. Well, anyway, I spent some time in Korea. I did not like Korea. It was a bad experience. I wasn't going anywhere. So I asked the CO, could I go to uh, get some applications for officer candidate school? He said, no, we don't have any applications. So I said, okay, I'll get some. And I called battalion and said, we need some applications for officer candidate school. And they all laughed like they hadn't heard a good joke in a long time. And they said, how many do you want? They come in a case lot. I said, well, send us a case. <laughs> so they did. And uh, I asked the first sergeant if somebody could help me because I don't know how to type. You had to have uh, seven copies, one original on both sides, and the other had to be carbon on both sides. And only three corrections and no mistakes. So every night I would go into the orderly room and ticky 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 ticky. As soon as I got to that fourth mistake, I threw one of them up, throw them away, and start over again. And when I finished the case, there were only a half a dozen applications still there. <laughs> but I did get the application sent in for officer candidate school. And uh, sometime later, I got a call 
from uh, Saigon that I was to go and meet the board for an interview. And uh, as I met the board, I'm standing there with my knees shaking and looking up at these officers glaring down at me. One of them said, Private O'Brien, he said, I don't want to discourage you, son, but you're not the only kid who ever thought of this. He said, we've processed about a quarter of a million applicants and we haven't accepted anybody yet. I said, well, sir, I knew if I didn't apply, I wouldn't be accepted. <laughs> and if I did apply, I might. <laughs> Well, they accepted me and one other man, wow. and the two of us went to OCS at Benning to uh, become an officer and a gentleman by act of Congress. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, the other kid washed out the uh, second or third month, and they sent him back to uh, Korea to start his tour over again as a machine gunner in a heavy weapons platoon. And I said, you know, I believe I can make it. <laughs> So I graduated and uh, was commissioned as a second lieutenant. I uh, did well, and I, I wanted to make the military a career then. I'm thinking, you know, this is kind of an exciting life, and I'll, I'll just stay in. And I applied for ranger school and all that other stuff. Thought I'd be the world's meanest man, a professional school trained killer. <laughs> well, they, uh, I also applied for flight school, and I was accepted for a fixed wing flight school at Fort Rooker, Alabama. When I got there, they had 87 men in uh, my class, and uh, we graduated 22. Wow. Out of the officer candidate class, we had almost 500, and we graduated 109. So it was pretty easy to get washed out of some of these schools. They, uh, they were pretty tough. Yeah. But uh, I graduated from flight school. I'd been there a couple of days. Now, my wife and I had uh, courted in college. She taught me how to ski, and uh, we did a few things together. We raced sports cars together and had fun together. And uh, so I uh, said, look, now's a good time. I can afford to get married. Make up your mind. And she'd been on again, off again before. Well, she said yes. So I'm assuming we're going to go across the county line to Phoenix uh, City and get a justice of the peace to tie the knot, and we're married. And I get a letter that says, my mother and father are driving me <laughs> to Alabama. To, oh, boy. <laughs> now what do you do? <laughs> you know? uh, so uh, we, uh, we had a military wedding, marched under the sabers, and, uh, and uh, got married. I was three days into flight school. She didn't get a honeymoon, but she forgave me. My first duty assignment out of uh, flight school was with the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, I'd been there a very short time, and uh, they decided that they didn't want any 82nd Airborne troopers that were called legs, didn't have the jump wings. So uh, one guy went down and applied for jump school to become a paratrooper. And they got all salvation and said, oh, who else wants to go? And he gave them everybody's name who was not jump rated. And so we all went to uh, jump school at Fort Benning. And uh, the fourth day, he quit and went home and left the rest of us there. <laughs> but uh, I was uh, trained then as a uh, paratrooper. I stayed at Fort Benning for about a year, nine months or so, and uh, made parachute jumps and uh, flew uh, for the 82nd with whatever missions they had. And uh, my wife, being a new wife and young and college degree and all of that and sitting at home all day all by herself was not good. And uh, she went and got a job working at the enlisted man's club. I went to work about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and I get home about 5 or 6 at night. Here I was a second lieutenant holding the captain's position and uh, doing my dead level best, very conscientious, trying so hard to make a good career. Well, she would go to work at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon and get off at 10 o'clock at night uh -huh. and we never saw each other, yeah. which created uh, problems. Yeah. And uh, then I had... Um, orders to go to um, Caribou School, which is multi-engine big airplane, and I like that. I had also just been recommended for a commendation medal, 
when uh, the domestic problems came to light and uh, they called me in and canceled the commendation medal in, in the caribou school and, uh, and uh, I thought oh boy they uh, told me that I would be limited in my career that I probably would not receive an assignment to a, an embassy or to NATO or things like that because of the problems that had been created so I thought well all right I'll still be okay and lo and behold, I got uh, orders to uh, fly the OV-1 Mohawk and was shipped to Germany. Yeah. Well, we were about an hour from a divorce and I thought, you know, she speaks German and I don't. She might be good to have over there. <laughs> in the meantime, she's thinking, you know, without him, I may never get to see Germany. <laughs> And so, for all the wrong reasons, uh, we stayed together, and <laughs> she was expecting then, and uh, we went to Germany together, and I uh, flew uh, secret recon missions uh, for the 4th Armored Division in Germany. I flew 123 secret missions. Each time I would come home from one of these missions, I had a little felt strip hanging on the wall my wife would put a little black X on the side of them. They go all the way down 123 times I went out to fly and uh, wasn't sure if I'd come back or not. Yeah, yeah. We had some real exciting experiences. We lost several men. Of course the official uh, notice was, that, oh yeah, the pilot became disoriented and strayed across and uh, he was shot down. Well, uh, that wasn't it at all. <laughs> we knew where we were and what we were doing. Could you say where you are now? Is that uh, Czechoslovakia, okay. Austria, and that okay. that area, yeah. and some East German stuff? Okay. But uh, the Mohawk uh, was not a really good airplane. When we started my transition school, we had uh, I think 14 students started. Uh, one quit, one washed out, and uh, the rest of us graduated. And within six months, six of the guys, half the class, were killed in that airplane. It was not a very forgiving airplane. Yeah. You make a mistake, you die. That's it. Yeah. You know? Short wings, underpowered and all, but it was a turboprop uh, aircraft. Didn't have real good de-icing uh, equipment and uh, flying in Germany there's a lot of heavy ice. And I remember one night flying uh, about 18,000 feet uh, and I was just going in and out of the tops of clouds, and as I'd go into the top of this cloud, you could hear the ice go rap, and it yeah. cling to the aircraft. You come out the other side, the, the front is all iced over. You can't see out the windshield, but you could see out the top. See. And uh, you, you'd fly out of that, and go through the next one, and rap, you know, and the ice on there. And as uh, and they had phony controllers that were set up on the other side of the uh, the border. We were within a quarter of a mile of the Czechoslovakian border and they would set up phony beacons that were much stronger than ours and controllers giving us directions that were speaking really good English but they were trying to lure us across. Huh. And uh, we had lost a man a, a month earlier but I came out of one of those clouds and a shooting star went by overhead and I hit the observer in the chest and said go, you know, and he's going to eject. And then I realized it's a shooting star. Oh. And I'm holding his arms down. He's reaching for the ejection curtain. <laughs> and um, I said, we're out of here. <laughs> and I yeah. turned around and yeah. went home. Uh, when I landed an hour and a half later, I, I was still yeah. shaky. That was a very scary experience. Yeah. Not dangerous, except scary because yeah. guys were getting shot down. Well, I, uh, I flew all those missions and uh, enjoyed the Mohawk. It was a fully acrobatic airplane and you could do all kinds of really fun stuff. And I used to love to take helicopter pilots up and go inverted because <laughs> you don't get inverted in a helicopter. And, uh, we, uh, we lived on the ec uh, economy. Uh, I was promoted to captain while I was there. I was a little disappointed because the rest of the guys that were promoted, uh, they all got together and decided we're going to have a promotion party. And I said, great, count me in, you know. And so they decided they were going to have a wine tasting party as a promotional party. 
Well, everybody knew that I do not drink alcohol. So they made sure that I was assigned as duty officer <laughs> on the night of my promotion party and I didn't get to go. But of course I was expected to pay my fair share of the, of the party. Well, that was Germany. We enjoyed Germany. We had good friends and uh, we had two children born over there. Uh, my first daughter, named Kelly, was the head of the village where we lived. Everybody in the village knew Kelly and they talked German to her and she would respond and Frau Hanvig would take her for walks and talk about the flowers and uh, the animals and then she would respond. Then she'd give her back to us. We talked English yeah. and the girl would respond but she didn't talk. Well, she's almost two years old and she still doesn't talk and I'm beginning to be concerned. Yeah. And one day I came home and my wife had just set her down in the baby bathtub and the little girl sat down and she jumped right up and said, Mommy, das Wasser zu heiß. <laughs> <laughs> A full sentence in perfect German, Mommy, the water's too hot. <laughs> and so those were the first words I ever heard my daughter speak. Well, from uh, Germany I got orders to go to Vietnam. What year was this? That would have been in uh, late 65, I think, or 66. I was there in 66, 67. It was May of 66. 66, I went to Vietnam. Okay. Now, the unit that I was assigned to was a Mohawk unit that uh, flew surveillance. And they had been sent over with a full complement of aircraft, which was 12 aircraft. They figured they'd lose maybe one a month. And so they sent over a six-month replacement with them. So they had 18 airplanes when they went over there. They've been there for about nine months. I'm their first replacement. I got into Saigon, spent two and a half hours calling these people, 101st Airborne up at Tuiwa. And I said, I'm your uh, first replacement pilot. And they said, well, we don't need you. We don't have any airplanes. I said, no airplanes? What happened? Well, they've all been shot down. Uh, I said, oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> and I went back over and I said, they don't want me. They can't use me. They don't have any airplanes. So they put me back in the little single-engine Cessna bird dog as a forward air controller okay. at uh, Play Coup. I had mixed emotions about going to Vietnam. Uh, I wanted to get out of the service. I realized that I was not going to make a good career officer. So I had applied to get out. They said no, and that's when I said, well, if it's for Vietnam, that doesn't matter. Send me to Vietnam. Let's get it over with. And sure enough, they did. <laughs> Two weeks later, I'm on my way to Vietnam. But this uh, forward air controller job is uh, not a good job. Um, you fly along the top of the jungle about the speed of smell, uh, throwing grenades out the window at the bad guys. Your ship is not armed, you have nothing to shoot with except what you can shoot out the window. Uh, we did carry uh, rockets on the wings that we could mark targets with. Uh, our job was to do visual reconnaissance, uh, report what's going on in the area, uh, resupply to the special forces camp, we did artillery adjustment, and occasionally, uh, when somebody got in trouble, we would call for uh, airstrikes. Uh, usually, the Air Force didn't like us to do that. They were specially trained for conducting airstrikes, but if somebody needed help in a hurry, we would do it. Uh, the first week or two that I was there, I got familiar with the area, and we had a... Um, an operation at a tea plantation and uh, it was a hot area. It was in the Idrang Valley. I don't know if you saw the, uh, saw the movie We Were Soldiers. Yeah. Well this is the operation that we were in okay. and uh, it was a, a bad experience. Uh, bullets are flying, men are dying, hearts are beating fast. It's <laughs> a lot of action going yeah. on and uh, when we had a hot area they would send two ships, one up high and one down low and you would fly around till you get shot at and the guy up above was following you on a map and if uh, you took some rounds why well, he could mark the coordinates we could call airstrikes or artillery so uh, I may be in the new guy on the block on the low ship you know and I'm flying around down out there and I'm talking to the guys on the ground 
uh, but I can't see anything. Everybody's wearing these tiger fatigues and they're in the jungle and uh, being uh, new and I haven't learned how to see down in the jungle yet. I, I'd uh, tip the plane up and lean over and look out the window and... Uh, Did you have an observer with you in the second seat? Uh, not that day. There was Quite a second I did. I'd have an artillery okay. uh, man in the back seat or a special forces uh, man in the back okay. seat. Uh, but that day, uh, I'm flying around and uh, the guy up above is calling me, Robin, you see anything? He said, I said, no. Well, uh, well you know, I think I mean, he getting nervous. He said, Robin, you see anything? And I'm flying along the top of the jungle looking down. At I said, no, I don't see anything, but there's one hell of a fight going on down there. I can hear at least six machine guns just peppering away. There's dead silence for about 30 seconds. He said, Robin, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but the only time you hear them shooting on the ground is when they're shooting up. <laughs> and I get this funny feeling in the pit of my stomach. I thought, what in the world am I doing here? <laughs> but uh, I didn't take around that day. No, didn't get hit at all. Uh, I was very fortunate. I, uh, I got shot at a lot, but uh, I didn't get hit a lot. We had uh, Montagnards, the uh, people, the mountain tribes, they have red skin, black hair, wear loin cloths and walk in a long, uh, fresh straight line and they're like the American Indians. I saw a group of them out the left side and that day I had an artillery observer in the back seat with me and these guys are running from us. Normally they wouldn't run, they would wave and that was about it, but they were running and they had a, about ten of them. They had, uh, the guys in the middle had a big bamboo pole strung between them and a Bengal tiger underneath this pole really? that they had killed. And I thought, how oh. interesting. I wondered, did they kill that with crossbows or, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I told the guy in the back seat, I said, look, get your weapon, look out the left side. I'm going to look out the right side. And I'm going to circle around and drop down right on the deck. I'm going to come across that trail about where I think they'll be and we'll see what kind of weapons they have and check these guys out. So I dropped down low enough that my wheels are about that far off the ground and the props stirring up dust and rocks. And I come scooting across this trail and just as I cross the trail I hear a gunshot and smell gunpowder. And I thought, oh man, this nut in the back seat fired his gun inside the airplane. So I pulled up and I looked back and his eyes are this big. <laughs> Some little guy had squatted down behind a bush and as we came across the trail, he ducked so the wing would go right over his head. He stuck out his rifle and pulled the trigger and the bullet went in one window and out the other and went between us. Good gosh. <laughs> I never saw the guy, but the guy in the back seat said he did. He's looking right down the barrel. But his knees are touching my back, so we're that close and that bullet went right between us. A lot of things like that, strange things happened yeah. in, uh, in Vietnam. It was uh, interesting work. Uh, for some reason I uh, would get scared and get over it, you know, and go yeah. on and do what you had to do. Yeah. One thing that uh, happened while I was there, my wife wrote me a letter every single day. Wow. Every day. Now, we only got mail maybe once every week or so, but the letters would come and I would ration myself. I would read one letter maybe three or four times and then I'd get the next one. Our daughter that was born in Germany had problems with her eyes, serious problems, needed surgery. So while my wife was in California, they scheduled my daughter for surgery. Now, my wife grew up next door to a girl who had gone blind and was blind. And I wanted to get some kind of priority on this phone patch that they had to call my wife and check on my daughter. And I went to the Red Cross and she said, no, we can't help you. I said, look, this is very serious and I really need some help. She said, well, off the record, if you were a minority, if you were an enlisted man, if you, and she listed about five things, she said, I could get you emergency leave to go home if your wife had an ingrown toenail. But because you were a Caucasian officer, I cannot help you. Gee. Now, what do you think I think of the Red Cross now? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Where were they when I needed them? 
I was very careful not to tell my wife about any of the serious things that happened. We got mortared really bad one night, wiped out a lot of airplanes, killed a bunch of people, and I did not mention it to my wife. I didn't want her to worry. And then a couple weeks later, here comes a package with all of the mail clippings at home, really? Plaku mortared, you yeah. know, and all of the oh, destruction and so on. Well, how about when you found the guys hiding from that? When you were running. Oh, I was running down to the perimeter to get in the bunker, and there were three guys crouched down behind a roll of concertina wire. <laughs> I said, really? what is that concertina wire going to protect you from? <laughs> you know, yeah. It wasn't going to help them at all. We, uh, I lost uh, a lot of roommates. Uh, one man that was with me lasted two weeks, and another one lasted two months, but uh, that was pretty, pretty tough. I, uh, we worked in support of the Special Forces primarily, and I would work on the ground. I went out on patrols with them and uh, set up the ambushes and did all the stuff on the ground and in the air. The, the ground war is different than the air war. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. That's... Well, in the air, if somebody goes out and flies and doesn't come back, you have nice words for it. He bought the farm. He crashed and burned. He augured in. But, but that's it. You know, he's gone. You don't. On the ground, you can smell the burning flesh. You can hear the screams of the guys that are dying. You can, you're in it. In the air, no, it's a clean war. You know, you blow up, you're gone, you're dead, and that's it. Your wife gets yeah. a telegram. Yeah. But uh, it's a completely different kind of war. It's interesting, you go out, you set up an ambush. Now, we had maybe anywhere from 20 to 200 striker forces that would go out with us and we would patrol, we would set up ambushes, we would do all kinds of things. If you set up an ambush and you spring it, you know, if the guys come by, if the first guy goes through your ambush area and the last guy is not through, you let them keep going. That's it. But if the first guy is still in the danger zone, in the kill zone, and the last guy gets in there, you spring that ambush. and in five minutes, everybody's dead. Yeah. You lose one or two men, they lose however many men they had. The jungle is an interesting place. They have hard packed clay trails. If you don't use the trails, they grow over in about a week. So in our visual reconnaissance, that's what we did. We checked the trails. But the Viet Cong and the Special Forces, we all use the same trails. The yeah. Viet Cong use them for classrooms, and they're really good artists. They draw how to dis dismantle an AR or an uh, AK-47, or and they'll, they'll put up their tactics and, uh, and everything. And it's very difficult not to walk along the trail looking at all these drawings on the ground. You do, you die. Yeah. And, of course, being an American, we're head and shoulders above all the rest of these guys. They're all built close to the ground, you know. Yeah. We uh, were on one patrol. I went into the village and... Uh, they issued me a, uh, a hammock. Well, it's the same hammock that the Vietnamese use. They're, they're short. Well, I tied one end of the hooch and one end of the, to the tree, and I got in, and the tree bent over, and I crossed my legs, and I wedged my head up into one end there, and I'm trying to sleep. And in the night, I hear some rustling in the brush between around me, and I think, oh, my God, we're getting ambushed. And I grabbed for my rifle, and that hammock went whoop, whoop, and threw me out splat on the ground. And the whole camp was roaring with laughter. Uh, they were changing the guard in the middle of the night, and I had heard that. Well, I lasted through Vietnam. I uh, was uh, given the Cross of Gallantry for Valor in Combat by the Vietnamese government. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. My uh, CO told me to be over at the Vietnamese compound at a certain time the next morning. Well, I went down to breakfast and everybody was there and, and I said, well, I'll see you. i got to go over to the Vietnamese. And I walked down to my motor pool, which is I think, 300 yards, and my Jeep has a flat tire. Well, I never used a Jeep anyway. Everybody knew that. I walked everywhere. Now, the CO and the XO and those people, 100 yards from their office to the mess hall, <laughs> they drive back and forth. Uh, 
So I went down there, I got a flat tire, and somebody stole my spare. So I go back up to the mess hall and ask the Jeep, uh, I mean the CEO, if I could borrow his Jeep. No, no. I said, well, how about the spare? No. Okay, so I go back down to the motor pool. I said, uh, how long does it take to fix a flat? Well, they said it'll take about two hours. Oh, not good. So I went back up to the mess hall again. I said, look, I need to borrow somebody's spare. and Nobody wanted to loan me their spare tire. So I go back down to the motor pool. I told the motor sergeant, I said, look, take the spare tire off the XO's Jeep, put it on mine, fix the flat, and put it on his for a spare. <laughs> So now I'm headed for the Vietnamese compound, and man, I'm just hitting the high spot, puff, 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 my coming off my wheels. The Vietnamese compound had a big wall around it with a big arch and an entrance way, and as you go in, there's a circular drive with a big flagpole and a building right behind it. And off to the right are bleachers, and off beside that is a parade field. Well, just as I drive in, I'm about... 45 minutes late, they have just released all the people. Half the Vietnamese army is out there with chrome helmets and drill guns, you know, and they're leaving. The band is still playing a little bit. There must have been 200 news media there, TVs and all this, and all of the people are coming down out of the stand, and I said, this is not good. So I went right in, went right around the flagpole and back out, and I never even slowed down. <laughs> When I got back over to our compound, the CO was on the ramp. He is livid. He has just been chewed out really bad by a four-star general. They were giving me this award and I didn't bother to show up. Oh. And he wanted to know about that. And I said, look, I asked to borrow your tire and you didn't help. And I'm fresh out of sympathy, sir. And walked off. Well, it was about a month and a half later a little package came in the mail and they mailed me my, really? my award. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Glad you got it. <laughs> well, thank you. I uh, got over Vietnam. I came home. I got to leave three days early because they had a plane load of remains and they had nine seats available uh. on a C-141. And I volunteered. There were no other, I think there were about six or seven of us, but there were a whole bunch of empty seats on there. Yeah. And I said, look, I've been flying visual reconnaissance. I know what's coming, and it ain't far away. If I can get a rowboat leaving in the right direction three hours early, I'm out of here. So I left early. And coming across the ocean on the way back, why every time the, the smell is terrible. First of all, you have the psychological effect of sitting there reading the names on the ends of these coffins. But they use twice as much embalming fluid and when they get up high, the pressure changes and they smell bad. Yeah. Well, when I couldn't handle it anymore, I'd go up on the flight deck. Every time I get on the flight deck, there's another red light blinking or a bell ringing or something. And finally, the last time I went up there, the co-pilot's windshield had shattered. And I'm thinking, this is a bad place to be. So when we landed in Elmendorf, Alaska, I got off the plane and walked across the ramp and bought a ticket home on Alaskan Airlines. I said, I'm not going to survive the war and die on this piece of junk going home. So I, I got home three days early. Coming and when, home, and approximately when was this? That would have been early in 67. Okay. I was uh, assigned to the flight detachment, uh, flight detachment at the Continental Army Command headquarters as a staff pilot. A really cushy job. But the guy came over to Vietnam and he said, hey, you guys are not filling out preferential statements about your next duty assignment. And uh, you should do that. I said, why? You use a dartboard to assign us anyway. No, no, no. He said, you guys are veterans. You have priority. So I said, why not? And I filled out that preferential statement. I said, first of all, my first choice is the flight detachment at Presidio, San Francisco. But in case you can't handle that, I would accept anything in the 6th Army area, California, uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, 
North and South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, uh, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, anything in that area. But in case you can't handle that, in case that's too tough, I would accept anything west of the Mississippi, being from California. Yeah. Well, the orders came and I am uh, now living on the seawall looking at the Chesapeake Bay on the <laughs> east coast. About as and, far east as you can get. Huh? And my buddy that was in the same unit with me got a uh, flight detachment at Fort Ord, California. I would have given my eye teeth for that. But anyway, we got home. My homecoming was a bad experience. People made obscene gestures. People called me baby killer, spit at me. It was not a good experience coming home. I, I paid my dues. I did what I was supposed to for freedom. And I didn't like being treated that way. It was not, not good. Then they build this wall, a monument. And I didn't go see it for about 10 years because I didn't want to cry. But I finally said, okay, time heals all wounds. I'll go look at the wall. I'll look up the monument, see that they build a monument to us. And I go up there and you hunt all over the place and it's underground. It's almost as if they're still ashamed of us. And so they build it underground and, and you have to hunt for this thing. And it was a little bit of a disappointment. I figured I had waited long enough and now I could handle it. So I went down and I looked up some of my friends' names on there and I sat down and cried like a baby. It was such an emotional thing. But I'm proud that I served. I'm proud of my service. I paid my dues, I think. I resent people like Kerry bragging about their service. I was in Utah walking across the, the, the square there underneath their, their temple and saw a guy in army fatigues and he had on a ball cap that said Vietnam veteran and on and on and I thought he was over there too. So I talked to this guy and I said, uh, what unit did you serve in? Where, where were you in Vietnam? Well, he said I didn't actually go. I, uh, I spent the time uh, scraping paint off of boats in uh, Oakland Bay. <laughs> and I thought, you scoundrel, here you are bragging about Vietnam service and wearing those campaign ribbons and you didn't, you never heard a shot fired in anger. And I was upset. And I told him, I said, you ought not to be doing it. Well, he said, I'm a veteran. I did serve during the time. I could have been sent over. Uh, well, I, uh, I, I, I resent these people, yeah. and uh, I, I'm upset about it, but, you know, uh, I am, I'm a happy man. Yeah. I live happy because I finally have learned not to worry about something you can't do anything yeah. about. <laughs> That's a good philosophy. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not uh, too concerned. I retired, and... Uh, I applied to every major airline in the world. I could see myself laying over in Hong Kong and Paris and enjoying the good life. And nobody answered my letter. And finally, Delta Airlines had gotten a uh, uh, authorization to fly to the West Coast, San Francisco and Los Angeles. And they were expanding and they interviewed me. And so I got a job with Delta. And uh, but it was a good career, a good career. I, I'm happy about it. Uh, I'm not happy that they declared bankruptcy and canceled the pension and the retirement and all of the uh, benefits for the pilots. Uh, but uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I went on a tour back to that area. And the tour it was in Cambodia and Laos and those places. We enjoyed that. They offered us Vietnam, too. And I said, no. I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not ready to go back to Vietnam yet, and it's only been 50 years. Yeah. But uh, I lost good friends, I got shot at. I, uh, few people in civilian life realize 
the sacrifices that the military make to stay in the military. Most, I think, stay in just purely for patriotism because they love America, they love freedom, they love the flag. And I guess I fall into that category, but I didn't stay in. I served almost 10 years. I was in Korea, I was in Vietnam, I was in Germany. But every year or two you move, your furniture gets pilfered and beat up, and the family has to change schools, and, uh, and it's a tough life yeah. for the military. Yeah. And I'm proud of these guys. I'm not proud of Senator Kerry. Yep. Basically, that's my story. You've got an amazing story. I, before we go further, I want to be sure that, uh, Ms. O'Neill, do you have, Ms. O'Neill, any no, comments you want to make? Anything you'd like to say? No, I think he's pretty well covered it. Okay. Tony, do you have any no, questions? Yeah. Well, I think anybody in this country that's interested in our country needs to hear your story because you're, you're obviously the type of person that would take the initiative to make things happen. I mean, just the story about the, your thumb as opposed to letting the doctor cut it off and you still got that thumb. And, yeah, <laughs> there it is. I mean, the story about the chainsaw that you went out and yeah, you could make five dollars more than what you went out and got the chainsaw. The, you know, calling the thumb, general, calling the general about something. the medic's job is something. You, you took charge. I called the general twice in my career. Uh, when I uh, was getting married three days into flight school, I went to uh, the headquarters. The receptionist for the commandant for the post, her husband was going to do the wedding. He was a member of our church and was a pastor, and so he would do the wedding. And I uh, asked her about a military wedding, and she said, well, you call Major Redwine. He is the protocol officer for the post. And, he'll, he'll, and so I went to call Major Redwine. He said, well, the thing to do is to call these ladies. They've all been around the military a long time. They know about military weddings. I don't have any idea, but you call these women. So I called the first one, and uh, it was a commandant, assistant commandant's wife, and very friendly. Well, she said, you're going to need some sabers. I said, well, that's good. Where do you get saber? Well, she said, contact somebody that's in armor. They all have saber. Okay, and I, I wrote that down, saber, armor. You know, and then I called the next one, and it was uh, uh, Easterbrook. And I called, and this gruff, gruff voice said, General Easterbrook speaking. Oh, that's the commandant. <laughs> so I said, oh, golly, what do I do now? I said, is Mrs. Easterbrook there? <laughs> No, who's calling, please? Well, I thought if I rush it out, he'll miss it. Mr. General Brown, thanks, sir. And I could hear him sigh. Well, Lieutenant, uh -huh. what can I do for you? And I thought, well, I'm nailed now, so I might as well. And I explained it to him, and he said, well, Lieutenant, we have a protocol in the military. If you need to call the Commandant's wife, it's proper to get permission from the Commandant. Uh -huh. If you want to speak to the Commanding General, you should call his aide and get permission and make an appointment. And I, and I yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. You know, all I want to do is get off the phone right then, <laughs> yes sir. Well, finally uh, he got through counseling me and I said, thank you sir, and hung up the phone and tore up the list. You know. <laughs> But the, uh, I went back to see the co assistant commandant's receptionist there, and uh, the assistant commandant walked in, Williams, and I said, she introduced us and said, Lieutenant O'Brien's getting married. I said, yes, sir, would you like to come? <laughs> well, yes. I said, well, good. How about your whole staff? You know, there isn't time to get announcements printed or anything, so you're invited. Everybody in the staff showed up wow. except the commandant. He did not show up because he was not invited. I called that red wine back and I said, how do I invite the commanding general? Don't invite the commanding general. <laughs> I said, well, I've already talked to you. What? <laughs> I said, yes. Well, he said, Lieutenant, he doesn't care if you get married. Forget it. So I didn't call it, yeah. but he was, a, that was the other call to the commanding general. <laughs> I'm sorry, you go ahead. <laughs> Thumb after he had gone through flight school, after he had 
flown for the 82nd Airborne after he had flown for two and a half years over in Germany. The uh, flight uh, surgeon. Yeah, the flight surgeon picked up that that last joint, the, the, huh. this one, was stiff. And he said, oh, you can't fly with that. He said, I've been flying with that. Really? Uh, no, then he got out the regulations and read them, and any, any joint that's stiff, then you can't fly. And he was going to have him grounded. Sure. Yes. But I went to Vietnam and never heard another word about it. This guy was a uh, flight surgeon, but he was also a psychiatrist. Huh. Huh. Very interesting fellow. You'd go in and you'd say, Doc, look, I got a bad <laughs> head cold and I, I don't think I ought to fly today. And I, could I have a couple APs? And he'd say, Sit down, let's talk about how's your mother. You know? <laughs> he He's going to analyze you. He wanted to psychoanalyze everybody <laughs> yeah. in the end. Nobody wanted to go see this guy. <laughs> Before we finish, I, I want you to just briefly talk about something that we discussed before we went on record. The mountains that you, the two of you have climbed, which is just sort of fascinating, I think, to anybody that would watch this. It has nothing to do with the military service, but some of the things that you have done from an adventure standpoint, like the climbing, if you would just do that to get that on the record for both, well, both of y'all. I started out, I climbed Mount Hood and got basic uh, crevasse rescue and uh, self-arrest and ice training and roping and things like that. Then, uh, then we decided we needed to climb some more mountains to get in condition. We did uh, the Grand Canyon in March. It we were going to go down the, with another, pilot with another Delta flight. pilot, and uh, we were going to go down the Grand Canyon on one side, cross over, and go up the other side. But the other side had eight feet of snow and was closed, so we went down the Kaibab Trail and came up the Bright Angel Trail, and we camped out in the in the bottom of the canyon. But it was March, and uh, we camped the, the first night at the top at the uh, South Rim, and in the morning we had icicles inside our little. Uh, a tent there from the condensation yeah, yeah, yeah. and the first thousand feet vertical we had to wear crampons because of the ice and the snow yeah, going down. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Julie was quite a trooper. She did the, uh, the Grand Canyon with us. Then uh, we decided we'd do uh, uh, Mount Whitney. Mount Whitney is the highest mountain in the lower 48 states. And uh, we did Mount Whitney and she was the first to the summit. Uh, then we did uh, Kosciuszko in Australia, we did uh, Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji is not a tall mountain, but it's, and it's very commercialized, it's non-technical, it just switch back to go up and up and up and up and up. But with most mountains you can drive up to the lodge, catch the ski lift up, <laughs> and then you hike the rest of the way. But with Mount Fuji, you start at sea level and you climb the whole thing. Oh, yeah. And so uh, we did Mount, uh, Mount Fuji, and uh, that was a really fun thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've done several mountains. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the, the later, uh, I had done some uh, in Korea, Mount Nojo, Mount Monsubong, uh, several other mountains, and knew some of the basics. Yeah. Uh, the motorcycle thing, uh, I just decided one day that I would uh, like to ride my motorcycle to the Arctic Circle. And so I got on and started riding and <laughs> spent the first night in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. The second night I stayed in Deming, New Mexico. That's a little over a thousand miles. I didn't stay in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, the next night I stayed with friends in uh, Mesa, Arizona. And the next day I went up to Flagstaff across the Grand Canyon, then down to uh, Boulder Dam, over to Las Vegas, and yeah. up through Utah, and stayed with friends in uh, Salt Lake City. That was a thousand miles that day. Jeez. And the next day, uh, I stayed in uh, next night in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. That was right at a thousand yeah. miles. And then I started up through Banff and Lake Louise and Jasper, and I said, this is great. And, took me four days <laughs> to go a, a few hundred miles there. But uh, then I got to uh, uh, Fairbanks and I picked up a guy in uh, Canada and we rode together for a while. And uh, then he stopped in Fairbanks and I went on up to the Arctic Circle yeah. by myself. It was really very interesting. The road is uh, all gravel and there are 12 and 13 percent 
steep grades and the oil company owns the road and there's no guardrails. Well, they're coming down 11% grade. They know they got to climb up 11%. They're really rolling. Yeah. And they, uh, they don't care if you're in the way or not. So that was interesting. Crossing the Yukon River, there's a bridge there, but it's got the boards are all beat up and cracked, and there's crevices. You can see the water through it, and there's spikes sticking out. And I thought, you know, if I ruin a tire crossing this bridge, I'm nowhere. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I made it all the way up there. There's a big sign that says, that gives the latitude, and says you're crossing the Arctic Circle. You know, you see on a map, the, that dash line says Arctic Circle. It's not there. I was so disappointed. <laughs> no, that dash line is gone. You skipped Mount Elbrus. You skipped Mount Elbrus. Oh, yeah. Mount Elbrus is the highest mountain in the European continent. That's uh, in Russia. It's uh, about that much less than 19,000 feet. Huh? It's not real technical, but it's very tall. The wind is brutal. It's uh, cold. They have a hut at about 12,000 feet that's rounded on all sides, a domed hut. No water, no electricity, no indoor plumbing, no anything, but you can get in out of the wind and the cold. It's like uh, sleeping in a refrigerator. Uh, but we lived for about a week on uh, boiled cabbage soup and hard bread and <laughs> salami. And of course, everybody's got the GIs, you know. Well, yeah. you come out the door of this thing and you curve around a, a steep, rocky, slippery little path to the cliff. The cliff is several hundred feet high, and they've got a scaffolding built out over it and a piece of plywood with a hole cut in it. That's your latrine. Well, they put up some walls, but this thing sags, you know. Well, down below, there's a glacier. And the wind blows across that glacier at about 40 knots and hits that wall and goes straight up through that little hole. That's like squatting over a blast furnace, you know. Well, everybody's got the GIs, you know. So I, in the middle of the night, I'm going down that pet trail on my hands and knees saying, I hope I don't fall over this cliff. Well, you get over that hole, you know, down the face, and then you put the paper in, you throw it down the hole, the wind blows it back in. Now you're trying to get out of the way of this paper. That was the toughest part of the whole climb was that latrine. But uh, we, we flew from uh, Moscow to Minervody on Aeroflot which also was a unique experience. Uh, they not only had just junk to fly, they're not good pilots. And uh, that was an interesting experience as well. But we, uh, we climbed mountains. Yep. We rode motorcycles to Yellowstone and back. And uh, we ski all over the world together. We went scuba diving. Uh, we've done really exciting things in addition to raising nine children. Nine children? Nine children. We have uh, seven daughters. Never enough bathrooms in our house, you know. <laughs> uh, nine children, two boys and uh, seven girls. And then we had a couple or three other kids that uh, their families kind of fell apart around them. They had no place to live, so they came and lived wow. with us. So we've raised quite a few more. But uh, we do love children. Well, I can't think of a better place to stop than that, because that's the highlight of the whole story. Is that, <laughs> <laughs> I married children. Superwoman. <laughs> you did marry Superwoman. I, in fact, I, t I think y'all are a super couple. And I, well, thank you for saying that. I, mean, I, I know Tony, about, Tony and I have loved hearing both of y'all's stories. And, I mean, you're obviously both adventurers and oh, yeah. soulmates and great parents. And it, it, it's just been a real honor to hear your story. And, I know the main purpose of this is to talk about your war years and your service, but over and above that, just what you did before you went in the military, what both of you have done together, is just an incredible story. And it, it's been a real honor for me and I know for Tony to hear your story. And I want to thank you for your service to the country and continue doing all these adventurous things you, you're doing now. Well, thank you.